The Supreme Court building is closed today, but the Supreme Court is open for business. This is the front page of the big ruling today that will keep Donald Trump on the ballot. Uh, and as mentioned in our opening reporting, uh, there was a lot to draw from in this opinion. We're joined now by former Obama acting solicitor general Neil Kotchal and Supreme Court reporter Nina Todenberg from NPR. Welcome to both of you. Uh, Neil, your thoughts on what the court did and didn't do today? Well, I think the decision after the oral argument, Ari, which went terribly for the challengers to Donald Trump, I think the decision was expected. I think it was wrong because I do think that the 14th Amendment, Section 3, applied. I agree with conservative scholars like Bill Baud and Michael Paulson that it applied and barred Donald Trump. But unfortunately, the Colorado Supreme Court's decision here was not really defended in the U.S. Supreme Court. And that led the court to get out over its skis today in its legal reasoning. For example, much of the what the court said today is that the 14th Amendment is about restraining state power, and states can't, uh, you know, police federal elections for disqualification as an insurrectionist. And I just think that's flatly wrong on the history because the 14th Amendment had multiple goals. One was sometimes restraining the states, but another, darn it, was barring insurrectionists from holding office, as what happened in 1868 Ohio. And of course, the amendment itself says that two thirds of Congress can lift a disqualification. So there's always a federal remedy against a rogue state or something like that. What really, I think, happened is that people knew Donald Trump couldn't get two thirds of the House and Senate to remove a disqualification as an insurrectionist. So I think it's um, an unfortunate but expected decision today. What do you think about the message or, or perhaps warning uh, from the concurring justices, Neil? Yeah, I think, you know, the Supreme Court, um, you know, works best when it doesn't just reach and decide issues, that it, you know, cares a bit about its legitimacy. The most important book in constitutional law written in the last hundred years by Alexander Bickel basically said the court preserves its legitimacy by not deciding things. And that's traditionally already how the court operates. But now, as our colleague Melissa Murray calls it, we have the YOLO court that's reaching out to grab issues. And here, you know, that three-judge opinion by Justices Sotomayor, Kagan, um, and Jackson said on page two, a really stark warning. It said, the court today is protecting not just itself, but the petitioner. And they didn't name who the petitioner was, but the petitioner is Donald Trump. And so what they said there is that the court went out of its way to protect Donald Trump and for future legal proceedings. And that, to me, is a fairly scary prospect, the idea that the court's reaching out and deciding momentous issues without the benefit of briefing or concrete case in front of it. Yeah, you mentioned that, and I'll say that by way of introduction to Nina. Uh, I, I, I've been very clear on air with viewers that there wasn't a lot of precedent for states doing this. So I, I expected it to lose badly. And Nina, as you know, with uh, nine in the, in the judgment, that's, that's pretty clear. Um, and yet, we can also learn tonight that the court didn't stop there. I mean, talk about a win. You could have had what a per curiam 9-0 unified opinion. Uh, what a nice way to start the week or the year. Um, but it appears that five justices, absent Trump justice appointee uh, Barrett, um, wanted to get more done uh, for their agenda or however they put it or what they say in their view of the law was necessary. So uh, your view on, on all of this, Nina? Well, I think that the, the answer to this, to some extent, is in the weeds. And I'm not going to go in the weeds except to say that the court not only um, said that Donald Trump couldn't be thrown off the ballot, which there were lots of liberal scholars who agreed with that. But it also said, yeah. made law, or tried to make law anyway, that said, um, that made it very difficult for any insurrectionist, no matter if they'd been convicted of insurrection, to be thrown off a ballot. Because it said that, the court said that, uh, Congress, only Congress can, ma can make this law. It can't be judges, for example, except, of course, the Supreme Court. And it also put very severe limits on what Congress could do. So it sort of made it doubly difficult for, for future situations. And so I think that the, 
you, you do see something of a court that on some issues is very aggressive. And you've seen that in other areas where there isn't even a decision by a court and they take the case to review it. Now, that's weird. Yeah, weird is a, a weird is a nice way to put it. Uh, some would say that that's nice uh, outside. <laughs> It is. Well, and you, and, you know, you've always been a nice person, the best we could tell <laughs> uh, in, in your work. But, you know, uh, some would say that it's uh, potentially an overreach or an abuse of the great unreviewable powers they have. Um, we've all made reference to the weeds here. Uh, for anyone watching wondering what is our aversion to gardening, you know, what's the deal? What, what are we afraid of? Um, some of the technical and dry details of what ultimately was debated over today don't matter in the main. They certainly haven't come up that often in American history, which is why we're not going deep into them. Uh, but I will read from how the uh, concurrence criticized the, the mostly conservative majority, saying, look, the majority reaches out to decide questions not before us and forecloses future efforts to disqualify a presidential candidate under this provision. In a sensitive case, crying out for judicial restraint, it abandons that course. And so, Nina, one way to say this is whether or not people see some potential validity to um, potential validity to what the conservatives thought they wanted to get to, they clearly didn't need to. Uh, and because it only benefits, as I mentioned in our setup tonight, people possibly accused of insurrection. It doesn't look like something that's going to matter to that many candidates. It looks like something to help this potential uh, defendant slash Republican nominee Trump if he if he gets the nomination, Nina? Well, it also means that uh, people who are running for federal office who might have been um, in the Capitol and have broken into the Capitol on January 6th, some of those people run for office. And you can't get them mm. off the, the... If they're running for federal office as opposed to state office, you're not going to be able to get them off the ballot. And that is something that, at least arguably... The writers of the 14th Amendment after the Civil War specifically had in mind that they didn't want to p have people who were uh, deliberately uh, threatening the, the legitimacy of the United States and its government being able to run for office. And that meant Jefferson Davis, for example, but it could mean Joe Schmo, who's running for Congress. And so that's why yeah. it is important. And then it's important also because we've got the immunity case coming up. and. You, you can see that there are ways to decide that case in a more limited way and ways to decide that case so as to preserve a lot of a former president's ability to be immune. Right. And that's where you say that whatever one thinks of, say, the five who ruled today, um, if the concurrence is at all correct, that they have stopped being judges and they are thinking about short-term politics and who may benefit or who to help or help the person who appointed them, uh, the whole lesson, the founder's lesson, the whole republic we're dealing with is whether, uh, even by that kind of short-termism, they don't understand that if you super-empower people to come into office to be immune forever, if you change that law because you want to help your buddy, uh, you may find that you're living in a, in a dictatorship someday, uh, and not because you meant to, but because you were being so blinded by potential partisanship. At least that's between the lines of the concurrence, potentially. I want to thank no, uh, Nina Totenberg and Neil Kotschow. I'm over on time, I but go ahead if you have a quick thought. I, I, my quick thought is that this is not, at least, this is not an overtly partisan decision, at least not to the people who made it. That doesn't mean that their gastronomy we view might view as different, but I don't. I don't think of them as partisan actors, but I do think that they were trying to get rid of this as a question that would come up a lot in front of the court, and they very successfully did that. In the immunity case, there are going to be different questions, and there will be different actors. And the per the biggest player there, one suspects, will be Brett Kavanaugh, who more than any member of the court has had experience with the president on a daily basis as his chief of staff every day working with George W. Bush. And f ever since he's been on, uh, been a federal judge, has had very mm -hmm. distinct views about um, immunities for a president. 